Massachusetts. Okay. Uh, we're interviewing uh, retired Justice Ed Wallen of the uh, Fourth District Division Three, and I am uh, Bill Ryler's dam. I still sit on that same court, and this is part of the uh, legacy project of the Judicial Council, where uh, oral histories are obtained from retired uh, justices of the Court of Appeal. Uh, and we're doing this on April 11th, uh, 2007. All right, at uh, 10.15. And at uh, <laughs> the offices of JAMS in Orange. All right, Ed, uh, let's start at the beginning. I know you grew up in Minnesota. Uh, what kind of a family did you grow up in? Uh, that's true. I was born and raised and went to college and law school in Minneapolis. Uh, my, uh, it was a wonderful family. My father was a bakery truck driver and then later a union leader in Minneapolis. And uh, my mother was pretty much a stay-at-home uh, mom. Sometimes she worked a little bit part-time. I had three younger sisters, a year younger, 11 years, and 15 years younger, all of whom still live in that area. And um, my mother came from a family of 10. Uh, she was the fifth in 10 children, seven boys and three girls. And all of that family was around there. And my dad had two younger sisters and one had moved away with her husband, but the others were all close, so large family gatherings were common when I grew up. Were your parents uh, both born in, the, in Minnesota? Both in uh, Minnesota. My mother in northern Minnesota near the Red Lake Indian Reservation. Uh, she always said she, she played with a lot of Indian children as a kid. Um, she was Danish and um, uh, primarily Danish. I, I think her mother was uh, Norwegian, her father and Dan and Danish, and her father was Danish. And his name was Jens, as we said it, or probably Jens in the old country, J E N S, Knudsen, K N U D S E N. Kind of gave the ancestry away, didn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, when I was named um, my father's parents, uh, my father was a, uh, my grandfather uh, on my father's side was a salesman. Uh, my grandmother was a stay-at-home. Uh, his name was Edward J. Wallen. Hers was Gladys. Um, her claim to fame is she lived to 102 and was sharp as a tack. Uh, well, you have good genes. Right then. to the end. <laughs> um, and um, my uh, grandfather's name was Edward J. Wallen, which is my full name, but the middle name was different. I was actually named Edward after one grandfather and Jens, which is my middle name, after the other. Um, but I had a wonderful upbringing in a very tiny house. We had a tiny house. I had a little area in the corner of the paneled basement that was my room. And I suppose my claim to fame within my own family is that no one in my family had ever gone to college, that whole extended family, until me. Well, before you got to college, uh, you, I assume you went to the public schools in I Minneapolis. I went to the public schools in South Minneapolis. Uh, any particular experiences there that you look back on now as, as having a shaping uh, influence on your career or the person well, you are? Well, I remember my sixth grade teacher, Florence Constantine, was an outstanding teacher and very inspiring to all of us. Um, my parents, especially my mother, were very focused on, on academics. Both had skipped two grades in school, but had graduated from high school in 1930 and 1931, respectively, and with no financial means to do anything other than work. But my mother uh, used to uh, teach me, if I was home ill, she would uh, get out a tablet and teach me uh, typically mathematics. And I remember when I was a little boy, uh, being taught um, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and long division by my mother when I was home for two weeks with uh, chicken pox or something, uh, some, some disease that kids don't get anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and every day, Mom and I would work on this while she was d ironing or doing whatever chores. And so I got a better education sometimes from Mom <laughs> than I even could get in the schools, even though they were very, very good. So, and then from high school, did you go straight to the University of Minnesota? Yes. Is and, that in uh, Minneapolis also? In Minneapolis. I, I was a commuter student for actually seven years. Um, four years uh, at the university as an undergraduate, 
where I was a political science major and minored in economics and history. And uh, those latter two subjects are still great interests of mine. I read constantly books on economics and business and uh, history. And, and uh, you went straight from your undergraduate uh, university to the law school there? To, right to law school. Yeah. At what point in your life did you decide that that's the career you wanted? Well, that's interesting. I, I didn't know what I wanted while I was in college. I started out as a math major because um, uh, near the end of my high school years was the time of the missile gap. And there was great fear in the country about our scientific um, gap between us and the Russians over military rocketry, particularly. And I was a very top student, uh, and also especially in math. And so Your my, mother did good work. Yeah. <laughs> and so my, <laughs> my uh, uh, counselors uh, thought, I think it was their patriotic mission to make me an engineer. And I didn't really feel comfortable with that. But I started out college as a math major. But as soon as I had calculus during winter quarter, which was at the far end of the campus during a bitterly cold winter, I um, kind of lost interest <laughs> and gravitated toward uh, uh, more of the social sciences. I think that fits your uh, personality better than yeah. being a, what do mathematicians do if they don't teach? I think well, they, uh, I've actuaries often. Actuaries for insurance companies. Or they, they could be accountants, <laughs> but, uh, w but we, uh, we in the law profession have excitement, whereas accountants come home at night and and their spouse asks them what, hap what happened during the day, and that was exciting. And what do you say, the eights, the fours? <laughs> I never could figure that out. <laughs> what, uh, any particular experiences in, uh, aside from your decision not to pursue mathematics, uh, any particular other experiences or decisions in college that led to your decision to go to law school? Well, I think that, uh, Public service interested me at that point. Uh, in my era in Minnesota, Hubert Humphrey was a dominant political figure. Uh, he became mayor of Minneapolis when I was about three and then senator when I was about six and um, eventually uh, a vice president uh, until I li lived out here. And um, my father knew him slightly way back before he was in office. And he, I never met him, actually, but he was the person that everyone in Minnesota looked to, and he was a great example of public service, which he totally believed in. Um, and uh, he would encourage people of all political stripes to get involved in public service. He was very ecumenical in his political uh, expressions. Uh, and so I think that sort of made me interested in it. My parents. Uh, avidly followed current events at the dinner table every night we would be discussing in addition to family events whatever current events uh, were of interest and I think that was, was a great was your help family me. quite interested in politics also I interested and my dad was uh, uh, active in this in uh, some sense uh, he was asked to run for office but never did that but uh, well, you said he became a union leader he at became some a point. union leader in uh, and in Minneapolis, the, the uh, uh, Democratic Party consisted of uh, working men uh, and women, largely union members, or a large number, a lot of union members, not many minorities, and the university academic community. And they worked together hand in glove to form the DFL, which is what the Democratic Party is called in Minnesota. Okay, what does it stand for? All right, we're ready. Okay, what, what is DFL? What does that mean? Uh, Democratic Farmer Labor Party. It stems from a, a progressive uh, party that existed in the depths of the Depression for a number of years um, called the Farmer Labor Party. And eventually they merged under the auspices of Hubert Humphrey in the 1940s. But the name re remained the Democratic Farmer Labor Party. While you were in college or law school, were you involved in any political uh, endeavors? Um, not very much. In 1962, while I was at, uh, I think, a sophomore in college, um, or maybe a junior, I, there was a, a very close election for governor in Minnesota, and I was trained, among others, to be a recounter of the paper ballots.
but in the end they decided not to use college students and so my father actually was one of the recounters and uh, what I remember about that is that there was great suspicion on both sides that the other side would try to tamper with the ballots and, and you were trained to watch for people who might have a piece of pencil under their fingernail to <laughs> spoil a ballot. When the actual recount was conducted and my father was assigned to do it in a number of areas where there was real doubt about the accuracy of the reported count, um, they used pastors or priests as the neutrals. And they in would sit at days, a table and only the pastors or priests would handle the ballot. In those days, they weren't involved in politics like <laughs> now. And, um, and they would, uh, both sides would agree. There was very little disagreement. The votes were counted with great care and ultimately the election night result, which had been a very narrow victory for the Republican, led to the Democrat winning in May, not taking office until May. And um, by 91 votes <laughs> in a state with about a million wow. 800,000 cast. Okay. Uh, but uh, the one political thing I remember, uh, when Hubert Humphrey was nominated for vice president in 1964, uh, remember the office had been vacant since uh, Kennedy's assassination because we didn't have the system now for replacing a vice president when a president ascends to the presidency. And so uh, Humphrey's nomination was a big deal in Minnesota, the first time any Minnesotan had been on the national ticket. And he was so popular uh, on both sides, really. Uh, and uh, Minnesota wanted to have some sort of a rally for him. And my father was a world-class organizer of events. If, if you had him doing it, he would somehow be able to inspire the troops to really put on a, a great event. So he was in, in a group of people that were trying to decide what to do. And they wanted to have something where they could get like three or 4,000 people. And my dad was, was uh, he thought that was nonsense. And he thought we should get many more. So he wound up being the primary organizer of the event, which was held on the state fairgrounds in St. Paul in a place called the Hippodrome. It had about 25,000 people. And it was called the DFL Bean Feed for Humphrey. <laughs> and my dad managed to get um, the Baker's Union to bake beans in these huge vats that they ordinarily used for commercial bakeries, uh, the hotel and restaurant employees to organize the lines, the milk companies and milk drivers to bring the cartons of milk, the coffee companies to bring the coffee in the big urns. Um, the hot dog buns were all donated. Uh, I think potato salad, and they served 25,000 people for one dollar each. <laughs> they charged one dollar. The idea was to get a big crowd. Yeah. And as I rec remember, it was featured on Walter Cronkite's news. It was this amazing sized yeah. rally. And um, I was put in charge by my father of the bean convoy. <laughs> that was my <laughs> political involvement. <laughs> and, and I got a Secret Service clearance. And we had three UPS trucks with five-gallon milk cans of beans on the floor <laughs> and blankets over them. And our mission was to safely transport the beans from the commercial bakery <laughs> to the floor of this building. Uh -huh. And they were piping hot, uh -huh. so we, we succeeded. Uh, and no one got poisoned, so I guess I, my security <laughs> clearance was honored. <laughs> now, uh, in law school, uh, were there particular professors that uh, inspired you or uh, any particular person that stands out? In your a couple of them. Uh, professor James Hetland, who was a civil procedure professor and a very active uh, a Republican in uh, Minnesota, a very good friend and a very good uh, professor. And Professor David Graven, uh, who... Uh, passed away not long after law school, uh, who was a terrific trial lawyer and uh, just a very uh, charismatic uh, professor. Those two stick out in my mind. Interesting, because I know that you have uh, always uh, had a big interest in civil procedure and uh, I received an expert the in uh, Amjur book uh, in uh, uh, civil yeah. procedure, uh, which I was very proud of. I don't know, maybe, maybe that's indicative of my bent <laughs> toward that area. So, uh, okay, so when did you graduate from law school? 
uh, spring of 1967. Okay, and, and what did you do next? I um, had to come out to California pretty much right away because during law school, I had summer clerked at the Dorsey firm in Minneapolis and loved it there, and they treated me great. And uh, it was the law firm in that part of the country, and I thought for a Minneapolis boy it was a dream come true to be able to be in that firm. They had offered me a job, and I was 99% sure I would take it. But when I got back to school in the fall, John Swenson, who's now a senior partner at Gibson Dunn and had been a dear friend in college and law school, had summer clerked at Gibson Dunn in Los Angeles. And he was uh, extolling the virtues of Southern California and urging me to consider coming out here. I wasn't too interested, but uh, uh, one of the deans who was in charge of the recruiting program or and um, John were both pushing me. So one day I signed up to be interviewed by two California firms, the only two I ever interviewed, O'Melveny and Myers and Kindle and Anderson. And they both offered me trips to California where I had never been. We couldn't afford travel much when I was a kid. I'd never been out here. So I came out the Saturday after Thanksgiving. And it was zero when I left Minneapolis. And when I returned the following Saturday, it was zero and snowing. And it was in the 70s every day out here. And um, Jim Kindle of Kindle and Anderson offered me a job on the spot. He didn't send me the usual letter. And a couple of days after I got back, I was probably shivering. I remember that last <laughs> winter was very cold. And so I accepted his invitation and came out to uh, California. And was this in Los Angeles? Their office um, in? They offered me a chance to be in either place, and I actually chose to be in Orange County. Okay. Oh, they, at that time, they already had an Orange County office. The, uh, the firm actually began as an amalgam of Jim Kindle, who was in Orange County, and uh, Jack Anderson, who was in L.A., and then um, uh, so it always had offices in both places. Yeah, Jack Anderson was an, an adjunct faculty at Loyola Law School, and uh, he was one of my professors Is that when right? I went to law school. He's yeah. a, talk about charismatic, yeah. Yeah. a very charismatic guy, and a billionaire, by the way, now, very, very successful. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, so you, you uh, then you were become a member of the California Bar when? Um, I took the bar exam that summer. In those days, it was given in late August. The bar results came out just before Christmas, and, uh, and I was sworn in on January 5th in uh, the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion in uh, Los Angeles. You had, had you started to work as a clerk with the law firm? I started to work as a clerk, and then I, I was uh, on leave with pay to study for the bar for a few weeks, and then I came right back there. You didn't take the bar review course in the Embassy Hotel in Los Angeles, did you? Um, where I took my. <laughs> I think it was the. I think it might have been called the Olympia or something oh, like that. It? But it was a dingy old oh, hotel in the basement, <laughs> uh, where I would go up there uh, every night, and uh, with uh, two fellows, one who moved back to Minnesota not too long after, but the other was Ron Bauer, oh, Judge yeah. Ron Bauer, whom both of us know, a longtime, well-respected judge here, and he and I started in. Kinlan Anderson at the same time. Okay. So <coughs> then after you started uh, out as a lawyer with Kindell and Anderson, uh, I think you, they lent you to the U.S. Attorney's Office, didn't they? Yes. Um, How soon after you had started there? It was there? really right away. I got the bar results just before Christmas, and between Christmas and New Year, I went up to uh, Los Angeles and uh, was interviewed by Matt Byrne, uh, the late uh, federal judge, William Matthew Byrne, Jr., uh, who was then the U.S. attorney. And uh, we had a cordial discussion, and he invited me to, uh, to go to work there. And my law firm had a kind of agreement with him that one or two lawyers at a time would, would uh, go from Kindlin Anderson to work there and then come back. Was this to get trial experience? Exactly. And it was supposed to be for two years. It turned out to be close to three in my case because I was enjoying it so much. Uh, and I had a lot of big cases. I had a wonderful What's experience. What uh, kind of cases were you handling? Um, it started out with um, uh, drug cases, but mostly uh, the trials were a lot of bank robberies, uh, a lot of mail fraud cases. 
uh, I became the office expert in mail fraud and obscenity cases, as a matter of fact, which were kind of grouped within the office. Okay. Um, I did a number of tax fraud cases, but those rarely went to trial. I did a number of selective service cases, but those were like an hour or two court trial, most, mostly on the administrative record, and they didn't really matter uh, in terms of experience. Well, what uh, was your experience with the federal judges? I, uh, you know, I had never, except for one 10 minute appearance, um, while I was awaiting my security clearance, I stayed at Kindle & Anderson, so it was early March before I actually started in the U.S. Attorney's Office. I had never been in state court, and that one appearance was in a church in Santa Ana, <laughs> in front of Judge Murray, where I represented the, uh, the wife of a partner who had some dispute over with her ex-husband, I don't remember what it was, and uh, the case was called, and she and I walked down the aisle, and there was uh, Judge Murphy up at the altar. I think you better explain a little <laughs> why the court was sitting in a church. Uh, yeah, in Orange I, County, I shared that the, experience. With I'm you. sure you did. <laughs> in Orange County, in the '60s, until they built the courthouse that's now on Flower and Civic Center, um, there was way more uh, business and judges than courtrooms, and so the. The county had condemned old churches in Santa Ana and made them into uh, courtrooms. So there were a number of people who had the experience of having been married and divorced in the same in church. The same church. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, except for that one appearance, the first time I appeared in court, I was a federal prosecutor, and I I learned um, I learned what it's probably like, as far as any of us can know, to talk to God. <laughs> because way off in the distance, way up high, in this hu these huge courtrooms were these federal judges. And uh, I remember feeling strange when I came back to state court because the judge was right there and I could speak to him or her in a, an ordinary tone of voice. Uh, whereas in the federal court, it was more like giving a speech to an auditorium when you were addressing the, the, the court. Do you remember Judge Charles Carr? My very first jury trial, <laughs> I'd been there a few weeks, and um, uh, I started out with a, a very short uh, trial, I think, in front of uh, Pearson Hall, a federal judge there that was uh, unremarkable. Then I had a two-day court trial in front of Judge Bill Gray, who was delightful, wonderful fellow and um, whose son, Jim Gray, as uh, is, uh, you and I know, Bill, is a longtime Superior Court judge here in Orange County. And then... Um, then there was Charlie Carr. Then Charlie <laughs> Carr. <laughs> and um, I had uh, been warned about Judge Carr, and so I went down and watched for, oh, a couple of hours the previous week, and he was yelling and shouting at the lawyers, and a lawyer in the office named Roger Browning um, gave me some very good advice, which I think probably applies to any trial lawyer uh, who's dealing with a difficult judge. He said, Ed, what you should do is you should think of yourself as, as wearing a very hard shell. <laughs> and no matter what he says, you just keep presenting your case, stay calm, and press on. And um, so the trial began. It was a bank robbery, the trial of a getaway car driver, and naturally I was a little bit nervous. My first jury trial in federal court, no less. I'd been there about a month. And, and uh, what happened is, um, uh, first the marshals forgot to bring over a witness who was a prisoner, uh, and Carr was ready to uh, tear me apart. But he carefully checked, and I had filed all the right paperwork, and it was indeed the marshals who had messed up and not me. And I think he was disappointed to learn <laughs> yeah, that. I'm sure he was. <laughs> and, and then uh, I was examining a, uh, a witness, a bank teller, and uh, she was testifying about what she observed and how the robber ran out the bank. And we were trying the getaway car driver, so what happened outside was crucial. Um, and she, uh, she said that he went ran across the parking lot, around a building, out of her sight. And I asked some question like, what happened then? And Carr exploded. And he said, counsel, who cares? He's out of sight. <laughs> well, what actually happened was that the, the teller had cut through another building and saw him get into a car, and then that car drove past her, and she got the license number. 
and she saw that the robber was Caucasian, the getaway car driver was African American, and that was important because he was the defendant. And um, so uh, he yelled and screamed about that, and I persisted and insisted that I would like to ask some more questions of the witness and then that the testimony was very important. So he turned to the jury and he said, ladies and gentlemen, the United States Attorney Matt Byrne is an outstanding lawyer, but the Department of Justice gives him a very limited budget. <laughs> so he has to hire inexperienced, untrained lawyers to, to uh, uh, prosecute the cases here. And we judges have to run a school for young lawyers and you jurors are the victims. <laughs> and so, so he, he he said, young man, we'll give you just three questions, three questions of this witness. So I asked three of the most compound questions imaginable, got this crucial testimony, and basically he kept quiet because he realized that I was right. Yeah. And um, uh, ultimately the case went well. We had things like fingerprints and other things that really helped out. And um, uh, he had banned many of the lawyers in the office from the office, uh, from the court, from his courtroom. So if you had a case that you worked on and it was assigned to his courtroom, you couldn't handle it. He would ban you. Uh, and so uh, the day after the, tr the verdict, he called uh, Matt Byrne. And uh, he, uh, his way of talking to uh, Matt was, Byrne, uh, Byrne, uh, you know that, uh, uh, who was that trying that bank robbery in my court this week? He didn't even know my name. In fact, during the trial, he always called me the young man for the government. He never gave me a name. <laughs> <laughs> I was 25. <laughs> and uh, he said, uh, Byrne, um, and Matt looked at the list, and he saw it was me. And he thought he was bracing himself or wondering how I could have followed up. He knew I was new. And Carr shocked him by saying, uh, well, you know, you know, he did all right. He's a little wet behind the ears, but he did all right. And uh, Byrne was amazed. He had never, ever called Got to do anything compliment. other than castigate one of us, you know. And so uh, I always said that Charlie Carr, for all his flaws, promoted me from the lowest second lieutenant to major in that <laughs> office right away if you were to apply military ranks. Matt Byrne came down to see me, and he uh, immediately big cases started to flow in my direction because Carr even liked me. I also had a lot of trials in front of Andy Houck, who was quite a famous yes. uh, jurist. And uh, how did you get along with him? Well, we had our run-ins, but he actually came to my farewell party when I left, so I guess he thought I was all right. Um, he, um, you know, he threatened to put me in jail one time, but I don't think he really meant it. Uh, Any other experiences or cases while you were working with the U.S. Attorney? I think the judges who taught me the most about being uh, a good trial lawyer were judges like uh, Pregerson, Gray, Ferguson, um, Irving Hill, who was very uh, demanding but uh, very fair, um, Avery Crary. Um, I, I had good experiences there. Uh, and I, I had sometimes two jury trials in a week. So when I came back at the age of 28, I was a very experienced you had trial many, lawyer. many more trials under your belt than uh, your uh, contemporaries at Kindell and Anderson, I'm sure. There, was, uh, there were three people in that whole firm that had significant trial experience. Angelo Palmieri, who was uh, one of the founders of the Orange County office when I was there, of the Palmieri-Tyler firm that still exists. and. Uh, he had had a lot of trials because he'd been a state prosecutor years and years earlier. And then a, uh, Craig Jorgensen, who had a similar experience ahead of me in the U.S. Attorney's Office, and I, and any one of the three of us had more trials than every other lawyer in the firm combined. combined. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, at that time, when you came, came back to uh, the law firm in Orange County, about how many lawyers were there in that office? I, I want to say um, 17, 18, 19 in that range. Uh, it wasn't huge. It wasn't huge. Uh -huh. And was it departmentalized? or? Did um, in those days, litigation wasn't as big a part of business firms as it is now. We had real estate. It uh, was always big in Orange County because there was always development going on. When I moved here in 67, there were probably 
750,000 people in Orange County, and today there's uh, About three million, three I million think. or more than three right. million, I believe. And so constant uh, building of uh, schools as well as houses, and the schools and uh, the public facilities meant there was a constant flow of eminent domain cases, which Angelo Palmieri was probably the all-time master of. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, we, ha we had a number of restaurant clients besides a number of big oh, builders. Did you basically handle litigation matters or were you? Just litigation. Just litigation. Uh, I worked with Angelo and then eventually uh, uh, Ron Bauer left after just a couple of years, three or four years, and uh, it was Angelo and myself. And then uh, after a short time, uh, Frank Rothrock joined us as a young associate. Uh, Frank is still a lawyer here in Orange County. So the three you of know, you did most of the trial work for that? All of it, for, yes. Yeah. In fact, we even handled the contested hearings. If there was a contested probate hearing, one of our probate or estate planning lawyers would take one of us over there as a designated pit bull, I guess, to uh, handle that matter. <laughs> so let's see, by the time you got back to Orange County, the new courthouse had been that's built, right. I, I, I think came that back in uh, fall of 1970s, September, yeah. October, okay. that period of time. Somewhere. So you never got to go to church with judges anymore. No, we had a real <laughs> courthouse, and quite a nice one. Uh, it's I, a bit run down now. After <clears throat> and now it's 30, more than 35 yeah. years older, close to 40. But uh, uh, do you recall about how many judges there were in Orange County at that time? I don't. I think there were 12 or 14 when I came in 67, uh, but I'm not sure. I do know that when I was appointed, I was the 37th position. Yeah. You the know they have like, what, 140 bench officers yes, now? Yes, <laughs> I've lost count yeah. now. Uh, um, so uh, have any particular experiences with the, in the Orange County Superior Court that uh, are notable? Well, I do remember when I first went there, the first couple of times, being just amazed that I was so close to the judge because the courtroom space between counsel table and the bench is so much shorter than it is in federal court. Mm -hmm. And almost feeling odd to be that, uh, that close and intimate to, to, uh, with the court itself, but enjoying it because I think that when you are closer, uh, you get a better sense of each other as you're communicating, both the judge and the lawyer. Uh, and I thought that our judges here uh, treated me very well. I remember one judge, Herbert Herlands, who was a very bright, very demanding judge. And uh, I was once asked to handle a default divorce for the young daughter of a very wealthy client. And uh, she testified that uh, certain stock in the company family business, which her father had given her, that was her separate property. And uh, so Herlin starts asking uh, where that stock is. Turns out it was kept in some safe deposit box. And he said, well, uh, did your father ever give it to you? <coughs> well, no, but he, he said he put it in. <coughs> yeah. So she said, well, or he said, did your father ever give it to you? And he said, Nobody told me it's in my name. Then he proceeded to pick up a pencil and explain to me that uh, if I say to you, I, uh, uh, counsel, that I give you this pencil, but then I don't give it to you, it's not really a gift. So how do we know this is her stock? You know, and it was an uncontested default divorce. <laughs> and I had warned the clients, fortunately, her father was there too, that this judge might was a bit eccentric. So. Rather than argue further over the stock and uh, attempt to prove it, I said, well, Your Honor, perhaps we're not ready to proceed yet by default, so we should go off calendar. So we did. And then I said it before another judge a week or so later, and it went right through. <laughs> known as judge shopping. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Any other uh, judges that you uh, appeared before that particularly come to mind? Well, I think the... Um, I remember the first time I be appeared before Judge Byrne in federal court uh, after I had been, um, frankly, I think one of his favorites as a federal prosecutor. And um, 
he was very tough on me, but in a, in a nice way. Um, and I respected him so much. My oldest son is named Matt, as a matter of fact. Uh, and, uh, but in state court here, um, Judge Bill Lee, I really admired. Um, uh, there were a lot of judges I liked. There were so many different ones. And I well, appeared and in a lot of different counties, too, so that... Oh, you were not confined to Orange County? No. No. Where did you have cases in Los Angeles? I right. Assume. I appeared before Richard Shower in Los Angeles. I had cases in uh, uh, Indio and Riverside. And Richard San Bernardino. Shower is another one of my law professors. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. An excellent judge. Yeah. And um, tried a case in San Diego, one case there. Um, but I didn't have as many trials in practice. Uh, as you did in the years of Not even close. Yeah. Uh, because. Uh, it was easy to have two jury trials in a week when I was a federal prosecutor, and it, it, it could be two in a year you were in a business firm. You were involved uh, it, while you were practicing in some political uh, litigation, were you a not? A little bit, yes. I'd, I'd forgotten that. That's good of you, Bill, to remember. I um, uh, was sitting in my office in um, on Halloween, in 1974, a few days before the election, I think it was a Thursday before the Tuesday election, when a candidate for assembly here named Richard Robinson uh, called me. I'd never heard of him. I'd been not, had no involvement in politics in California whatsoever at that, up to that point. And uh, he had been served with a, an injunction, a, a, or a TRO rather, barring the delivery of all of his campaign mail because of some technical failure to name the uh, person who was uh, uh, the candidate that it was supporting. I mean, it was obvious from reading the mail, but technically it was it. not there. And um, the judge who had issued it uh, in Orange County had purported to even bar the U.S. Post Office from delivering the mail. For which, of course, he would have jurisdictional issues <laughs> there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> obviously, he would have no jurisdiction, as is obvious to you and I. But maybe it wasn't to that judge. But the post office was taking the position that it would honor it until it got overturned. And so uh, he had been served with this at like six in the morning, and it had been signed during the early a.m. hours. And he was uh, and delivered to the post office, and it was totally destroying his campaign because in his whole campaign, all the last five days of mailings, was all held up. And um, so he wanted to come and see me, and he had been recommended to me by several different people, he said, because I had done First Amendment cases in the U.S. Attorney's Office. Um, so I, he came over there. Um, I was leaving for lunch. He caught me. I, I had instead uh, ran to the corner and got a sandwich, and he came over, and I sat and ate my sandwich while I listened to his tale of woe and um, found out there was going to be a hearing in federal court uh, at 2 o'clock. I told him I doubted if I ever would get paid because uh, politicians would have a poor reputation for paying their bills, but it looked interesting. So I went up to Judge Jesse Curtis, a fine federal judge in L.A., who had a hearing and he rescinded the order as it applied to the post office. And then I'd set up a hearing the next morning, at which uh, I went out to Judge Bill Lee, and he uh, dismissed the lawsuit because it had no basis in the law reading. And um, that saved that assembly seat, and the then assembly speaker, uh, Leo McCarthy, uh, had heard about all this and was very impressed. So it sort of put me in a in a political position I had never even thought about getting in because uh, I was just being a lawyer. And did, weren't you later then involved in uh, Robinson's campaign also? Uh, Robinson, uh, the 74 uh, primary was when the, um, no, 74, I think it was 74, the Political Reform Act had been passed. And Robinson and also uh, some other politicians like Bruce Nestandy were anxious to obey it. They didn't want to run afoul of it and take a news story criticizing them for not complying with the Political Reform Act. And it was like 25,000 words of utter nonsense, especially to a non-lawyer, maybe even a lawyer. And I had read it for some reason. I don't know why. And so I began to answer just phone calls from 
people in both this was um, basically both parties. reporting, reporting yeah. requirements. How do I how do we report this? And no one knew because it was so new. And I just say, well, I think what you should do is this. And so people from both parties would call me. I never charged anyone, and because they were trying to comply. And I thought that as a matter of public spirit, when they're trying to comply, I should help them. So I did, and I got known for for that knowledge. And uh, uh, then uh, Robinson asked me to be his treasurer. The reason was he didn't want to get in trouble over that law. So I did that for a few years, like four, I think, uh, before I went on the trial court. Uh, but I never really got active in politics outside of being involved as a lawyer. Um, I was sort of an advisor for Robinson, I guess. Uh, okay, now you, at some point, you uh, considered going on the bench or somebody suggested well, it. How did that come about? What happened is um, my, I mean, most active political inv involvement probably was as uh, Judge Bruce Sumner's treasurer in 1978, uh, actually late in 77, I think. He took a leave of absence from the bench to become a candidate for Attorney General of California. Judge Sumner was quite famous as a judge. He had headed for 10 years the California Constitution Revision Commission, been a Republican uh, member of the Assembly from Orange County for a while before that. And um, he was interested in uh, challenging Howard Jarvis's Prop 13, uh, which I still believe today has caused uh, been an economic calamity and uh, fiscal calamity and uh, for our state um, and he, um, he but he started out as a candidate ultimately we were unsuccessful in raising enough money he wasn't as well known as Yvonne Burke and uh, Bert Pines who were from LA and uh, so he withdrew in about February and within a week or two, he Excuse decided... Me, he was a judge of the Orange County Superior Court right. at that time. Yeah. And he went back on the bench and then ultimately filed for re-election to the court and was re-elected and served there until he retired. Um, and uh, But a week or two later, he felt that something should be done to challenge Prop 13, which was so destructive of the whole plan of our state constitution. And uh, he convinced me that we should participate in that. So um, he had a lot of files on the bases for the various provisions of the state constitution and uh, I wrote the uh, pleadings and the briefs for a a petition to uh, challenge it. Uh, this is in state court? In state court and um, uh, about I want to say maybe uh, late April we challenged this and uh, we're successful in a minor way in that the uh, court ruled that the description on the ballot was wrong and misleading and changed that somewhat. But we were trying to remove it from oh, the ballot. Oh, this would be before the... Uh, had before a, the June primary. The primary was in the first week of June. And uh, we were trying to get it removed from the ballot as multiple subject and we had a myriad of other grounds. Um, and that was unsuccessful. I do remember that experience that um, the legislators in both parties wanted us to hold a press conference at the Capitol. There was so much interest in our challenge because Prop 13 was dominating the, the political news as the primary drew nigh. And um, uh, so they wanted the press to come and to be able to uh, ask us questions. But no one wanted to take the blame for it because there was such a steamroller for Prop 13. So for the first time in the memory of any reporter who came, there was an announcement of, a, of an event for the press in the Capitol Press Room in Sacramento that n didn't say what legislator's office it came from because nobody <laughs> wanted to be tied to it, but they were all rooting for us. Yeah. And we'd walk through the hall in the Capitol and they were all cheering for us. But anyway, uh, we had that uh, matter together and then Bill Norris, who is retired now from the Ninth Circuit, uh, was then with Tuttle and Taylor in L.A., and he'd been retained to prepare a post-election challenge for Prop 13 by virtually all of the state school districts, community college districts, and, and uh, 
basically educational institutions. And Bill and I were uh, friends, and he asked me to join him. And I had all this research material because I'd already done a lot of it. So he and I uh, and two young lawyers from his office basically lived in his office, getting a few hours sleep at the Biltmore Hotel a couple blocks away, starting about two or three weeks before the election and going till maybe 10 days after, um, working as hard as we could, uh, sometimes sleeping right in our chairs, and prepared a challenge. Uh, and while that was going on, Bill was aware that I was a candidate for Superior Court. And he uh, told me I should probably not put my name on the brief because he didn't think I could ever get appointed. And I said I didn't want to be on the Superior Court if one could not uh, honestly express uh, his role as an advocate on any kind of legal case. And so I decided that I would put my name on there. And I signed whatever I signed uh, on the brief, like John Hancock, so everyone could see I was there. <laughs> and uh, how I first became a judge, though, was uh, Bruce Sumner called me one day, and uh, he had been having coffee in his chambers. He was the probate judge that year. This would have been early in 78, about May of 78, early May. And um, uh, Tony Klein, who was uh, Jerry Brown's legal affairs secretary and the scout that found candidates for judgeships, was in town to give a, a talk at some bar luncheon, probably how to be a judge or something. And um, uh, he had gone over to the courthouse and uh, saw Bruce's name and so went in and they had coffee and Tony was lamenting that he couldn't find lawyers with a business background uh, to be judges. And they were all making too much money, he said, probably like you, Bill. Uh, <laughs> and so um, uh, Sumner said, uh, as he replayed it to me, he told uh, Tony Klein, asked him if he knew Ed Wallen. He said he'd heard of me, but that I was in some big firm. And he said, well, Ed's pretty young. I don't think he's making a lot of money yet. <laughs> and uh, he likes public service, so maybe he'd be interested. So uh, they decided that uh, Sumner would bring me to the lunch and ask me on the way if I was interested. And I was 35 years old and had barely my 10 years in. And I said to Bruce uh, Sumner that I, I would be interested someday, but that I thought being a candidate at my age would look ridiculous because I was only 35 years old. And Bruce was calmly, in his calm way, said, Ed, if you decide you're a candidate, you will be appointed. Well, that made me really think about it. I had two children at home at that time, a daughter 10, a son 8, and I hated being away around the country for depositions and so on. And I liked the idea of being home every night that I could be as a judge so I could coach Little League and coach my daughter's softball teams and stuff. So uh, within a few days, I, I was a candidate. And um, then in August, um, Actually, while I was on vacation in early August, August 2nd, I think, uh, I was 78. appointed in 78. Mm -hmm. So my candidacy was a very quick one. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, all of a sudden, I was on the Superior Court, no doubt to the shock and amazement. Of, and you were uh, there for colleagues. over four years, as I recall. Early August of 78 until uh, December 27th of 82. Okay, so well, four years a little later, five we'll talk about what happened in December yeah. of 82. Uh, and I, as I recall, you spent most of your time in law motion department, did yes, you Yes. I started out in a trial department. And um, in those days, nobody wanted the law in motion assignment. It was an incredible a lot of amount work. of work. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I did know. it for two years yes. myself. And um, nobody wanted that job. Uh, and so it was a, a challenge for the presiding judge, who I think was Byron McMillan, if I remember correctly. It might have been Walt Karams. I've forgotten which one was first. Um, to recruit um, three candidates for the three law and motion departments. And so uh, I had always groused whenever I was unhappy with whoever was the incumbent in law and motion as a lawyer among my office, you know, I'd grouse about some rulings or whatever. So I thought it was, in, it was my duty to be willing to take the heat myself. So I volunteered to the amazement of all and sundry to take law and motion. And um, 
In those days, you could serve for six months, and at the end of six months, if you hated it, they would give you another assignment. And a number of people did just that. But uh, I wound up staying for three years. I started in the middle of December because someone was on vacation in 78, and I stayed through 81. And then in 82, I did it again for four or five more months because someone was ill or something. Do you recall remember. who the other judges were that were handling law motion? Uh, when I started, it was Bob Green and Alice Marie Stotler, now federal judge Alice Marie Stotler. Alice Marie's whole background had been in the criminal law, but she was a real scholar and hardworking. And uh, she once told me that she had read through Witkin's uh, procedural summary in preparation for that assignment. Now, anyone could slog through I mean, that is amazing I mean, to me, but she have, might be able to. Don't you keep a copy on your hands? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and she was actually assigned to the courtroom next to me uh, with, uh, by the presiding judge who told me that way she could come and ask me about procedural things. She never needed to do that. She was a very good student on her own. So and you enjoyed judge. that assignment? I loved it. I, I still today, uh, 39 years after I've been a, over 39 years a member of the bar, I love lawyers and dealing with lawyers. It's what I do today at, at JAMS. And every morning I would be seeing 30, 40, 45 lawyers uh, doing and looking at their craft, which was their pleadings, and then listening to their arguments. Uh, well, I thought uh, it was uh, beyond my wildest dreams to have such a fine assignment and be able to work with such wonderful people every day. And so, uh, and then in the afternoons I did the ex parties, uh, the uh, TROs and such. Uh, and uh, during your uh, uh, stint at the Spear Court, are there any particular cases that stand out or ex other experiences that uh, you think uh, you'd like to comment on? Um, you know, so many went through. I do remember one that got a lot of notoriety at the time. Um, there was a company called Newport Equity Funding, which was uh, putting together syndicates uh, to make loans in the late 70s, early 80s, when interest rates were way up in the double digits, uh, 16, 17, 18, with a lot of points. and. Uh, they had gotten the retirement money of many people, particularly from Newport Beach, Laguna, and that era, that area. And these people were parts, uh, had pieces of these loans. And uh, all of a sudden, one day, the uh, owners and managers of that company didn't show up. And there were many millions of dollars in loans that were outstanding. And uh, the employees who were not at the ownership level came, but they didn't know what to do because there was no one there. And uh, so the state uh, attorney general uh, rushed in. Uh, and uh, later that day, uh, I uh, issued an order permitting a, a gentleman, former California uh, real estate commissioner named Milt Gordon, to become the uh, forgotten if we called him a trustee or a receiver, and uh, on condition that he be there at 7 a.m. the next day. <coughs> he took over the business with his team of people, and um, in my order, I had uh, said that uh, he needed to report. Uh, these people were panicked, panicked, had their life savings tied up in this. This was a, a Friday. He needed to report, I think, on Wednesday in court which is not much time for a receiver to gather up the facts. So on Wednesday, he shows up, and, and there's like 200 people there, uh, mostly couples, uh, older couples, desperately concerned about their savings. And he only had a five-page report, but it was quite positive. It appeared these loans were paying and that uh, it wasn't nearly the disaster that everyone had feared. When I heard this huge throng showed up, first they moved us to the biggest courtroom that could be found. And while that was going on, I took his five-page report, and I had a clerk make copies for everyone. And so my clerk announced there would be a delay while the report was being copied. And to the consternation of Milt Gordon, I just gave it to everybody. I figured it was a public document. It was their money. They ought to be able to see it. 
So they all read it. Then I took the bench, and I, uh, uh, there were a number of lawyers there, maybe 10 or 12, 15 lawyers, and I said that uh, they now knew everything I knew because they had the report and that we were going to start by inviting the lawyers who are here to ask questions of the receiver or of me or anyone they want. And so we were going to try to find out what was going on here. So the lawyers would come forward, I'm so-and-so representing so-and-so, and ask the question. And uh, then one of the uh, folks said, said, excuse me, uh, Judge, does that mean if we don't have a lawyer here, we can't ask a question? And I said, no, no, as soon as the lawyers have finished, I think they will have asked most things you care about, but I'll be happy to entertain questions from the rest of you. Thinking, boy, I might have bought myself <laughs> trouble here. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so I went ahead, and uh, we, we uh, got all the lawyers' questions. Then I said to the rest of them, all right, now, the rest of you, if you want to ask a question, I want you to raise your hand. When I call on you, I want you to stand. And I want to, you to state your name clearly and spell it for the reporter. And then you can go ahead and ask your question. And there's a memory trick that I could do then. I don't know if I still can, but uh, I could remember every name. So about 20 different people asked questions. And once in a while, people would come back and ask another one. And so I would call on them by name. And people started to notice that. They were kind of in awe of that, I think. And uh, so everyone got their questions answered. And then we announced we'd have another hearing, I think, in 10 days or two weeks, something like that. And uh, I, asked the, uh, uh, I asked them to bring 100 copies of the report, told everyone to please come early because we would be handing them out. And I did that for like three more times to the point where the news was positive, the receiver got a financial institution to handle the collection and uh, disbursement of the proceeds of these notes, which were paying huge interest, and they were almost all being honored, so there was not a risk. And uh, uh, finally, in uh, the third or fourth hearing, um, near the end, one fellow stood up and he said, uh, Judge, I don't really have a question. I just want to say that we're all just thrilled that you're handling this case because you let us see the information and you let us ask questions and we feel so much better about our investments and uh, and then they all got up and gave me a thunderous standing ovation <laughs> shocking my colleagues who Next wondered door. what the heck was going on in that courtroom and so uh, lawyer, they all asked me naturally and I said it was just another day in law and motion <laughs> and uh, ultimately uh, uh, that whole matter was over in like six or eight weeks, and if it had gone into bankruptcy, which was the other option, it'd probably still be going on. <laughs> uh, but anyway, I had fun with that. Um, and there were so many cases I did that were of significance business-wise, um, maybe to uh, development in Orange County, uh, but I didn't really keep score. It was, uh, as you know from having done it for a long time yourself, uh, they're just kind of racing through there, and you just make the best call you can, and there's 35 more the next day. The, uh, uh, then in late 82, I believe, uh, a decision was made to create a new division for District 4. And um, then, of course, you were one of the people who were appointed as soon as the division was created. Uh, what's the history surrounding the creation of that division? Uh, well, as a matter of Okay, how did the creation of the uh, Division Three come about? What was the background? Well, it? in about 1980 or 81, there began to be a lot of talk about the backlogs in the Court of Appeal throughout the state. And the worst backlog was uh, here in the 4th District. Uh, we then had divisions in San Diego, Division One, and San Bernardino, which was Division Two now in Riverside. And all, almost all the Orange County cases went to San Bernardino, and by this time there were hundreds of briefed, fully briefed appeals that had been sitting and there just weren't enough jurists to uh, even come close to catching up with them. So um, Assemblyman Robinson uh, from here in Orange County, who although not a lawyer, was the biggest supporter of the AOC, the Administrative Office of Courts, in the legislature. He was their man, their go-to guy 
when they needed legislation. And he was, uh, I don't know why, but he always loved the courts and, and loved the law, even though his background was actually in accounting. And uh, so he carried a bill which created um, 18 positions. Um, and it was intended to be, I think, 15, but uh, it was 18 through some somehow in, in Northern California. It created the division in Sa or the district in San Jose uh, and new divisions in Los Angeles and San Francisco and then created a new division here in Orange County which you and I uh, served on. I, I, I've always wondered why did they create a separate district in San Jose and why didn't they create a district here in Orange County? I'm Was trying there a to remember. For that? Uh, there's no good reason. I, I, I've never. Um, I've asked that question of many people, and nobody knows the answer to it. I think maybe the reason is, uh, well, I, you know, I really don't know, because, because I actually believe, as a matter of judicial administration, that all three divisions of the fourth, fourth district Sh should, uh, should be separate districts. I, I agree with you. Yes, it makes and, uh, no sense. Yeah, the current arrangement is, you're right, makes no sense at all. Uh, for one thing, it makes no sense uh, voting-wise because the voters in the other two division areas uh, vote on uh, my, uh, me and uh, the yeah, two times I was there and you, and they, they don't even, uh, we don't even hear their cases. Imperial County and in yeah. your county. Uh, yeah. So, and, but, well, maybe uh, there's a little safety in that, though. <laughs> maybe. I don't know. I don't know. Um, but, uh, yeah, maybe the, the less they know about us, the more likely they are to so support us, uh, Bill. But um, uh, that was held up by some litigation for a while, and then in the fall, that litigation ended. And um, The litigation uh, I, was basically motivated by a desire to keep Governor Brown from making the appointments. Right. Was it, it was a, a politically sponsored uh, lawsuit, which, oddly enough, was filed in... Uh, um, El Dorado, uh, either Placer County or El Dorado County, I can't remember, be, uh, because the judge happened to be a former uh, uh, Republican political leader, and he instantly issued a TRO against the creation of the courts. But that was all resolved in, in the fall, uh, around October or so. And uh, I had been told for many months that, um, um, that Jack Trotter and me were going to be appointed. The other two were up in the air. Um, and uh, uh, one of them was likely to be Alice Marie Stotler, and actually there was a there was a problem there that uh, uh, a gentleman named Mike Capizzi, who was the U.S. was the U.S. was the district attorney here in Orange County at that time, still a lawyer here, was on the Jenny Commission, uh, and. He had led the effort, uh, supposedly, at least the governor believed this, I don't know if it's true or not, that had resulted in the torpedoing of all women candidates and, and minority race candidates, which could, could have been based on qualifications, except one, Alice Marie Stockton. Yeah, it would not she be was based the, on qualifications. If she was the only one found qualified that met oh. those criteria. And that included uh, Justice Sonnenshine, who was, was rejected by the Janney Commission. Well, um, this uh, I understood anyway. No one ever, he never told me this, but made Governor Brown very angry. So he uh, resubmitted uh, Sonnenshine's name. And when she got through the commission the next time, uh, she was ultimately named instead of Alice Marie Stotler. And so, that's how Justice Sonnenshine was named to the court rather than Stotler. And uh, there was also some opposition uh, to uh, Justice uh, Tom Crosby or Judge Tom Crosby. Who was who then also a judge of the court. was High also Superior. a Superior Court yeah. judge and, um, and who has uh, uh, served a long time on the court, I think longer than anyone ever has on Division Four. And Tom, um, so when the Jenny Commission met the first time, Justice Trotter and I passed right through. There was some discussion of Tom. I think that was held over. Then he passed the next time. And I believe Justice Sonnenshine was uh, actually rejected by the commission. And that was uh, uh, so in order to pay back Capizzi, whom 
Governor Brown perceived was trying to get him into a box where he had to name Alice Marie Stotler, uh, which he had no objection to. He submitted her name. Yeah. Uh, he just wanted to because, show who's boss. Yeah, he sh so that's how he pushed uh, Justice Sonnenshine forward, and she was ultimately selected. And Alice Marie Stotler soon retired from the Superior Court and then uh, was in practice for a year or two and is now the chief judge of the federal court here in this, this central district. Okay. So then in December, you were all four of you right, this morning I was, uh, in 82. I was nominated right after Thanksgiving and confirmed the Monday after Christmas, which I think was the 27th of December of 82. And um, at the same time, um, a number of new justices all over the state were confirmed in a, a period of a few days, um, some in uh, hearing in Northern California and some in Los Angeles. And uh, they included uh, Ed Butler in San Diego, um, probably someone else I can't remember. Uh, but Tony in the, Klein, I think, wasn't he? Tony one? Klein, in, uh, if he wasn't already there, he was At one first, of the ones, I think, right. in San Francisco. Yeah. But um, in Orange County, it included uh, Justice Trotter, who was named the presiding justice. He had been a justice for about eight months out in Division Two. Uh, replacing the late uh, Stephen Tamura, and um, myself, Sheila Sonnenshine, Tom Crosby. Uh, so it was Trotter, Sonnenshine, Crosby, and Wallen for okay. now that you have four, starting period. Four of you are, uh, are justices uh, uh -huh. in jurisdiction in most of a good part of Southern California, and. Uh, where do you go? Do you have a courthouse? Do you have a <laughs> well, that, library? Well, that, uh, <laughs> that was an interesting time because on the day we were confirmed, we didn't have so much as a pencil, a tablet, or a book, or a place. And uh, so we were to begin serving. Now, it was the holiday weekend, and um, I think all three of my colleagues went on holiday skiing trips, or in Justice Sonnenshine's case, I think probably to Hawaii. But I stayed home. Only what could I do because uh, w the clerk's office, if you can call it that, was a basement in the Superior Court building where there was a little area that the Orange County clerk had kindly allowed the uh, Court of Appeal to temporarily use. And Dave Johnson was there. He had been he a, had been appointed clerk of Division Three. Yeah, he had been a senior deputy clerk or something like that in San Bernardino, and he had been named to become the, the clerk Orange County and we had met and had a couple conversations right around that time but it was Dave all by himself and he was taking in filings and they were getting ready to ship over hundreds of appeals from San Bernardino but he had no place for them because he had a uh, uh, the clerk's office that he had in the courthouse was uh, no bigger than maybe uh, I don't think if it was 10 by 10 and uh, so Dave was there, and we were supposed to find a place to go. So uh, the SunWest Bank building on uh, uh, Parton and uh, Fourth uh, Street. Uh, Santa Ana, Santa Ana Boulevard uh, was one of the places we looked at, and we ultimately uh, rented space there, uh, but it wasn't ready. I think I think we had between uh, November. Uh, being nominated in November and being confirmed in December, we had uh, looked around and found that place. It was ready for us to move in on a temporary basis late in January. So the first court session was actually held, um, <coughs> pardon me, I think Justice Sonnenshine had not yet returned from her vacation, but early in January uh, there were a number of writs coming in and we needed to do something and so Justice Trotter hosted us in his kitchen in uh, North Tustin where he still lives and um, uh, there was a reporter named Tim Alger for the Register who had been saying to uh, uh, all of us that he would like to cover and do a story on the first session, session. and uh, Tim later became a lawyer and the last I heard was at Gibson Dunn I don't know what he's doing now but Tim was a very fine reporter and he covered the courts and so he wanted to come, so uh, Jack uh, notified him, and uh, he came over to Jack's house too. So we were sitting around Jack's kitchen table, and Tim and a photographer showed up, and and 
he sat down and interviewed us a little bit and did a picture, a color picture, which ran in the register, and uh, which I still have a copy of somewhere, and did a story about us. And I remember that Jack's wife, uh, Catherine, had to leave, and so she had put some croissants in the oven for us. And uh, Jack was supposed to take out the croissants, and uh, he forgot. <laughs> and so pretty soon we're smelling the burning croissants. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so the next story, uh, Tim's story, talked at, uh, about, in fact, the little thing on the front page was that Presiding Justice Trotter had burned the croissants <laughs> at the first court session. <laughs> we all got a kick out of that. Um, but we, um, we sat around and, and uh, handed out some cases uh, for consideration, just informally, a few cases that Dave Johnson had brought over. And I remember the very first decision we made was a writ involving the American Contract Bridge League and I believe it was a First Amendment issue, but I'm not sure. Uh, we discussed it and studied the petition, and the three of us determined that it should be denied. And then Jack and Tom were going away for the weekend again, or go skiing or something. And so I went down to the courthouse, and Dave typed something up, You're and I signed it. You're talking about the Superior it. Court courthouse. Yes, yeah. the Superior Court courthouse. Yeah. And, and I signed it as the acting presiding justice, uh -huh. denying the writ. Uh -huh. It was taken to the Supreme Court, which ordered us to hear it. So I always said, I signed the first order of that the got court, reversed. and it got reversed. <laughs> <laughs> and we ultimately heard it, and, and uh, I think we actually agreed with the petitioners. Uh, Where, what did you, when did you first hear oral argument? How long after the um, court started? We didn't have a place in the SunWest Bank building where we could hear it. In fact, I should tell you the first place we were in there, um, there was a little office uh, for each of us. Uh, quite small. There was an, a big open area, and then across the hall was a huge open area, and the books had arrived in boxes, and uh, we were so busy getting started, and so many cases were coming in, that we determined that we would only use the books as we needed them to cite uh, cases. Well, pretty soon we had boxes, and they all came in a cello wrap, and it was a mess. So one day, a bunch of the lawyers and I got together and put them all on the shelves finally. But um, uh, it was just a, a, a chaos uh, situation. The clerk's office had a little space on the same floor. I think it was the eighth floor. And a more permanent space was being built on the third floor. But it was many months before we moved there, maybe a year. You know, just to store the, the records and the files, yeah. and there pro probably were no adequate shelves even. To On the it. eighth floor where we were, there was a lot of unused space, undeveloped uh -huh. space in the building. And I remember Judge Dave Thompson, who was uh, uh, my law clerk, brand new lawyer, just, just uh, finished law school, um, very handy. He was looking for a place where he could work because there was almost no place. So he brought a long cord from home and a fluorescent fixture. And he ran that cord like 120 feet or so and, and then hung the fixture in the rafters because the ceiling wasn't finished uh, and uh, also near a window. So he was on the floor there with us in an area we really weren't paying rent on mm -hmm. uh, and it wasn't being heated or <laughs> air conditioned. And that's where he worked. Uh, but then uh, we got into our, well, our before facility, you got but in, before that, yeah. in March, uh, we finally had an oral argument. And what we did is we made a deal with the city of Santa Ana that we could use the city's city council chambers. So, uh, Did you consider going back to church? <laughs> well, we should have, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Prayed for uh, <laughs> guidance. And, no, I um, mean, because of the experience in the Orange County Superior Court. I know. Court, yeah. And we, we uh, so for our first several months of oral argument, I don't remember how many, uh, what we would do is when it came time for oral argument, we'd put our robes over our arms and walk from the SunWest Bank building over to the Santa Ana City Council Chambers, which was a few hundred yards, and, uh, and go in there and uh, use their uh, the council room for oral argument. And the first oral argument, I remember Justice Bill Bedsworth, who was then the head of Writs and Appeals in the DA's office and a super lawyer, as we all know, um, had one of the cases, 
and uh, we were ready for him and it appeared that the DA was challenging an order which under the case law was neither appealable nor writable as I recall I don't remember what it was and so uh, uh, we sprung that on him an <laughs> oral argument <laughs> and poor Bill had not anticipated that and so he had to go back to the books and he concluded uh, within a day or two that uh, we were correct and dropped his case um, and but we had some civil and some criminal cases that first day and I know Bill had the first criminal case and now he's been on the court for eight or five ten years or, you know, five or six I think I'm not sure uh, he Probably was there when more. I left and it's okay. more than eight uh, okay. that I've been gone time time flies when you're having fun yeah uh, <laughs> uh, and so uh, but I do remember that and uh, so then uh, how when did you or when or how long after the division was created did you move into the more permanent facilities on, in the SunWest Bank building I want to say it was it was about a year before that and you did have Floor a regular courtroom there. Out. You did have a courtroom there. And we did have there. a courtroom there. It was not large, but it was adequate. Yeah. And uh, we had the whole floor. Um, and uh, there were still just the four justices. Uh, for a long time, there was just the four of us. But before, even before that, of course, you had to hire clerks. You had to hire yes. staff attorneys. Uh, that all. I hired took time. the first uh, staff attorney, who was named, uh, whose name is Stella Ruiz. She uh, worked with me for about eight years and then moved to um, Davis near Sacramento and has now for many, many years been a, a staff attorney for Vance Ray. Oh, really? But both Tom Crosby and I knew her. She had been a contract attorney for many lawyers and did brilliant paperwork. She was a great arguer. And I called and hired her about an hour before he called. <laughs> so I got her first. Did, uh, and he hired Kim Dunning, now the presiding judge of the Superior Court, as his first staff attorney. We, when the four of you uh, uh, were appointed, uh, did you know each other other than very casually? Or did you um, have any kind of I relationships? Didn't know, I didn't really know. I don't, I don't think any of us knew uh, Sheila Sonnenschein particularly. But uh, Jack and Tom and I all knew each other. In fact, I should talk more about Tom since, unfortunately, he's passed away, mm -hmm. and, and uh, I loved him. We are. But uh, Tom uh, and I uh, jointly represented uh, people in a couple of criminal cases. Uh, one was a federal case, and Tom was uncomfortable with federal court, so he got me into it. Only I got it dismissed the first time I showed up, <laughs> and so that Scared ended him, that man. one. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, uh, pleased the client no end. Uh, but uh, and then another one. It was a fraud case. Another one uh, was a, a kind of political case where, unfortunately, some over enthusiastic uh, campaign workers had registered to vote in uh, an election in '74, I think in houses where they really didn't live. Mm -hmm. It was like eight or ten of them. One was a lawyer even. Uh, they just wanted to vote for the candidates mm -hmm. they worked for and loved. It was not a f smart thing to do. It was probably not worth prosecuting, but they were Democrats and it was Orange County so they got prosecuted. <laughs> I say that because subsequently this came up a number of times with people in both parties and it was never subsequently mm -hmm. prosecuted. But, but so Tom you had and I jointly Tom. represented them, and we got acquainted in about early 75 and became very close friends, uh, spent a lot of time together. Um, and uh, when he went on the court, the Superior Court, in about, 70, about 80, I'm going to say 80 without knowing for sure, uh, he became a law in motion judge two courtrooms down. And I remember... Uh, he used to work late, just like me, reading through those motions. And um, uh, about uh, 7, 38 o'clock, we'd think it was time to take the rest home. And so one or the other of us would step out in the hall and holler down the hall, and we'd go down to the garage together with a basket <laughs> of the remaining motions with us. And um, uh, the, what, what he would do is he would uh, say, uh, he would say, hey, Baldy, which is what he would <laughs> call me. Well, as he a didn't joke. have a lot of hair himself. He, no, he didn't either. <laughs> but he's the only person who ever called me that. And I knew every time I heard that it was Tom. Uh, and, uh, but a, a great judge and yeah, a, tell a me, great what, man. What was Tom like? Uh, he was 
brilliant, first of all, absolutely brilliant. Had as high an IQ as anyone I think I've ever known. He'd been a Peace Corpsman in um, Peru. Peru, that's right. Uh, he had uh, been a deputy district attorney, did very well in that office, went out and he practiced criminal defense law. So we didn't encounter each other as lawyers because I really didn't do that. Uh, but we met in this uh, case where these people had been charged with voting improperly and uh, hit it off and so just spent a lot of time together and then uh, we were both uh, close to Assemblyman Robinson kind of as advisors to him um, uh, because we didn't have much money we didn't we, we weren't contributors but he was anxious to have our counsel on all kinds of different issues and we, um, uh, I went on Superior Court, and Tom really didn't want to do that. He just wanted to go on the Court of Appeal. But he was told in about 1980 that if he ever hoped to do that, uh -huh. he had to serve on the trial court first. Maybe it was 81. And uh, so he did, and he served in law and motion. Um, he, uh, his writing is excellent. And he was very famous for his writing. So very succinct and to the point. Yeah, sometimes had a very tart pen. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, he and I wouldn't really argue, but we would have disagreements where he would get be really angry at something that occurred in a case, and he would write all kinds of stuff in an opinion, and then it would go down the hall to me. And I think if he knew I was on the case, he knew what would happen. Yeah, tone I'd, it down. <laughs> I'd tone it all down. I'd just yeah. do it with a red pen. And uh, then I would bring it back, and I'd, come on, Tom, you know, you can't say that. And he would say, uh, pretty chicken, Ed, pretty <laughs> chicken. <laughs> but I'd never t uh, wanted to deliberately be insulting toward, especially a trial judge or even a lawyer, because there's no appeal mm -hmm. from what we would say about a lawyer. And we may not know everything. And so he and I would... Well, that's that would be our major disagreement. Tom was very liberal, so sometimes we didn't agree. I don't think I'm as liberal as, as he was, uh, but uh, I was very close to him and, and his wife uh, Patty, and uh, uh, he was uh, very uh, just a very good friend. I was uh, really crushed when he passed Did away. Did you and Jack Trotter have a relationship uh, before the appointment? Uh, Tom and Jack knew each other because their offices were actually on the same floor of what was then the Crocker Bank building at the corner of uh, Washington and Maine in Santa Ana, which is only um, two or three blocks, if that, from the Court of Appeal where it is now. I was at 1020 North Broadway. Uh, and. Uh, I knew Jack because he was a highly, highly respected uh, member of the uh, Orange County Bar, served as bar president in 1977, I believe. And, he was and, on the Superior uh, Court also. And then he went on the Superior Court, I think after me, and before Tom is what I remember. Uh, I, I, uh, I remember appearing before him I in Superior Court. I think a few Court. months, maybe six months after me and maybe a year or so yeah. before Tom. And he was also in Law in Motion. But uh, Jack, I knew Jack because uh, I stumbled on an excellent med mal wrongful death case. Uh, and uh, I didn't do those. In fact, I had a lot of doctor clients. I just wasn't going to do those. But uh, Jack was a first rate, maybe as good a trial lawyer as there was in Southern California in his time, not only just in Orange County. Um, and. Uh, so I went over to see Jack with my client, and we told him about the case. And, and I had done some investigation, had some medical records, and Jack took the case and did a great job with it. Uh, and uh, so we were pretty well acquainted. And I was, I was thrilled to have two friends like Tom and Jack uh, join me on the Court of Appeal. I couldn't believe my good fortune. And I didn't know anything one way or the other about Justice Sonnenschein, whose entire practice had been family law, an area that I didn't go into, mm -hmm. really. Um, and obviously, it didn't encounter in Law and Motion. I think she appeared before me a, a handful of times in Law and Motion, maybe two or three. And um, so did Jack, and so did Tom. Mm -hmm. So all of them, and uh, maybe I think you, I think appeared I did. in front yeah, I of think me. I did as a judge mm -hmm. 
before they were colleagues on the Court of Appeal. I may have appeared before you on the Court of Appeal also because I remember <laughs> being in the uh, SunWest Bank building courtroom. That, that's probably I don't remember who, who did, what the panel yeah. was. But. <laughs> well, and, uh, well, that's good. I'd, I'd rather be known as an unremarkable <laughs> member of the panel. <laughs> but um, uh, Jack was um, uh, just a, you know, a wonderful person. And when we started the court, uh, a few months into it, everybody had just worked like crazy because Nobody knew what we were doing. Well, you started we out with a huge new. backlog, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, and a huge backlog. And one day, Jack just took everyone, um, might have included their spouses, I don't remember, to a very nice lunch or dinner at the Villa Fontana, and he just picked up the check. That's the kind of guy he was. Not the state of California, but mm -hmm. presiding Justice Trotter. And uh, so we all loved him. He hated dealing with personnel matters. He wasn't really happy in that job. No, I don't he? think so. He he doesn't like dealing with personnel matters, and um, I do remember. I, I guess it's all right to share this. Um, there was a uh, particularly bad, non-performing uh, uh, secretary, uh, sort of a. Uh, Floating we, secretary. We now there. call them judicial assistants. Yeah, okay, judicial assistants. Instead of a pay raise, we gave them a, <laughs> gave them a better, better title. title. Yeah. And and the librarian were both non-performing, and um, and I was grousing about that to Jack and Tom and Sheila. Kind of stayed away from anything related to administration. She traveled more than the rest of us really, and so she, she wasn't really involved in that kind of um, work at the court. And so Jack, <coughs> you started to talk about some personnel yeah, matters that uh, Jack was uncomfortable with. Yeah, uh, Sheila wasn't involved in the administration of the court that much. She didn't really care for that either. But Jack's, it was Jack's job to handle, obviously, the employment and HR issues. But he hated that. And so um, these people were, their non-performance got more and more obvious. and. Um, Finally, it got to the point where even Tom, who was very gentle about personnel issues and tried to stay away from them as well, had, was complaining to Jack. And so one day, I remember Jack came in to see me, and he said, uh, you know, when I was in practice, um, if somebody wasn't performing, I just didn't like to deal with that. So I would go home early on a Friday, and Marty, referring to Marty Handweiler, his partners were Marty Handweiler and Neil Bahan, great guys and great lawyers, would handle it. And uh, I said, well, that's fine, Jack, but you're the presiding justice, and so I think it's up to you to handle it here. And he would look very uncomfortable, and he finally said, well, if he left early on Friday, would, would I it? take care of it? <laughs> and I said, uh, Jack, uh, I had the same problem with Angelo Palmieri in practice. He always wanted me to do it. Um, I said, Jack, as far as I'm concerned, I'm a soldier on your team. And uh, you're in charge. And if that's the mission I'm assigned, I will carry it out. He said, oh, great. He's <laughs> and so he left early on Friday, and I, uh, I, I lightened the payroll by uh, uh, gently as I could, telling those people not to, that we would not be needing them. And um, gosh, I remember um, some of our early, of course, Kim Dunning and Dave Thompson, uh, both uh, Superior Court attorneys. judges. And there's, there's uh, Carla Singer, who was much later a staff attorney for Henry Moore. And then... Um, Franz Miller. Oh, Franz Miller, who served for a dozen years on the court, 10 with me. A brilliant, brilliant fellow, and he's an staff outstanding attorney. judge now in Superior Court. All staff attorneys at the court. And there's, a, there's two more, whose names have just escaped me, who became judges. Uh, one I know in L.A. Dado? Uh, uh, no. No, no. Um, and, uh, but just, just great people I'm very proud of. And I'm very proud of a lot of our summer uh, and, and school year externs, too, who have done so well in practice. Yeah, that ever since I've been on the court, uh, we've had uh, law student externs. When did the court start using law student Almost experts? Almost right from the beginning. Uh, students would, would come uh, uh, and ask to be hired. The first semester, I remember I had I had picked out six, which was foolish because it was way too many, but I didn't know what I was doing. 
and they were all wonderful. I remember uh, five of them were women, and uh, one of them um, was a man who I think is now a judge, as I think about it. Uh, Glenn, last name not recalled, um, but he might be a judge now, I'm not sure, a commissioner. And I remember once uh, uh, all these gals were getting together at um, the um, restaurant, Claim Jumper restaurant on 17th and Tustin, and they wanted me to come there, but it was the same day that uh, Bob Rickles' formal enrobing ceremony was being held out in uh, San Bernardino, and I wanted to go there. Uh, he was appointed in San Bernardino the same time the four of us were appointed in Orange County. And uh, so uh, I said, well, if I got back in time, and uh, I was... Uh, I'd been single for a year or so by then, and so uh, they I said, well, they wanted me to come. So I got back, and I looked at my watch, and I thought, well, maybe they're still there. So I walked in, and they're all still waiting for a table, so it was perfect. <laughs> and, uh, but I, re I still remember the comment that, uh, uh, reminiscent of the television show uh, Charlie's Angels, because when we got called and we all walked to a table, there were some lawyers in the bar there, which was a popular place. And, I heard one of them mutter to his colleague, oh my gosh, look at that, Wallen's Angels. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but all of them have uh, done well. I've lost track of a couple of that initial group. But, um, and after that, I had almost always, I had two in the fall, two in the spring, two in the summer. And um, they did great work for me. And something else I'm very proud of I haven't mentioned in my career I had one secretary in private practice the whole time, um, Marlene uh, Tierbach, and now she's uh, remarried and using a different name, I can't remember. Marlene Adams was her maiden name. And uh, she had not gone to college when she went to work for me, but she was brilliant. And I thought she should go to college. Uh, she was 18 when she became my secretary, and in six months she was the best secretary in my law firm. Not even 19 yet, or maybe 19. And um, so I wanted her to go to college. So I made an, a deal with her that she could go to college, and she had to make up the time. But I wanted her to go to her classes. So she started going to classes, and uh, I said that I wanted to see her report card every semester, and that I expected, because she was so smart, that she would get all A's. Ultimately, she became a lawyer. She worked for me for eight years. Oh, then Sandy staff, Williams. She worked for you as a staff attorney? No, she, wor she never worked for me as oh. a staff attorney. She wanted to come back and be my secretary at the Court of Appeal after she finished college, and I said, no, I think you should go to law school. And she went to law school at Loyola and did very well. And um, she practices out in Riverside now. And then the other one is Sandy Williams, who I think you know. I know. Sandy, who was yes. um, my secretary for nine years or nine and a half maybe at the Court of Appeal. And she also went ahead and did her college work and then went to law school and has now been practicing for years. She's on the staff of the Superior Court. And uh, so I've told many people that I was very honored to have such outstanding persons to work with. But it's also true that after they watched me for a number of years, they figured if he can do it, <laughs> and, and so they became lawyers as well. But uh, that's a special yeah. source of pride for me, really. Uh, Bob, you were on the Court of Appeal for about 18 years? 16 years and uh, two months. Okay, and yeah. uh, then you retired and you got busy uh, doing ADR work. Right, and, and yeah. But uh, during your period uh, on the court, of course, you handled many, many, many cases. Uh, 18 thousands, years, yeah. thousands of cases. Many thousands, yes. yeah. Uh, uh, there's one that I worked with you, worked on with you when I was sitting on assignment on the Spear Court. Uh, I think because of the death of Henry Moore. We haven't really talked about Henry yet. Yeah. Um, and that was the uh, baseball case. Uh, yes, the uh, Angels, Golden yeah, West very, Baseball Club versus uh, City of Anaheim. Yeah, and what, what, I, at least I thought that was one of the most interesting cases I've ever. It, it was a fascinating involved. case, and at the time, it was the most expensive civil litigation in the history of Orange County. I think the the three parties, 
which were essentially the Angels, the Rams, and the city of Anaheim, the Rams football team, um, had spent in combination, I was told, about $25 million in fees. The, 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 so it was a huge case. It was dispute, tried for nearly a year. The dispute involved who owned certain parts of the Angel parking lot, right. wasn't it? Um, Gene Autry's version, Gene, Gene Autry's version is that he was uh, enticed to bring the Angels down here by a stadium where he was promised 12,000 and some odd ground level parking spaces uh, for his fans. Uh, and now years later, uh, Anaheim and Orange County, particularly the city of Anaheim, were anxious to lure the Rams to Orange County. And, they succeeded in part because they promised the Rams that they could develop, um, literally develop, parts of the parking lot with high rises and uh, uh, offices or com office commercial, whatever they wanted. And that would entail the uh, construction of parking ramps for baseball and football fans. Autry did not want that. He believed that would slow down the ingress and egress to the stadium and make his stadium and his baseball team less attractive. So he uh, sued. So that's what Golden West Baseball Club was, the Angels. And uh, so he sued both the city and the Rams. Um, the city was sort of caught in a dilemma because they had promised uh, uh, one thing to Autry and another thing to the Rams. In fact, Autry testified in the case that uh, that the uh, city had had sold him the rights and then it sold the rights to Anaheim and he says that's like selling the same horse twice and you can't do that <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, Judge Frank Domenichini had heard this trial and it took forever it was very complicated and he'd ultimately ruled uh, and uh, the case was randomly assigned at the court to Justice Henry Moore who we hadn't uh, talked about but he he joined the court as its, uh, as its fifth justice in the year I don't now recall. Um, Some, sometime in the later 80s, wasn't it? I think it? so, Mid yeah. Mid later 80s, yeah. Yeah, and Henry um, was actually ill at the day of his confirmation hearing, but he was there. And then uh, he went on to, uh, he was going on to Santa Barbara or someplace, and on the way he got so ill he wound up going instead to Scripps was out for many months and when he came back he he looked like he was 90 years old I'd never seen anything like it he looked barely alive white as a sheet and the rest of his time at the court he was mostly ill even right. though he was there for years then he died in 94 right he died in the spring of 94 and uh, Dave Sills told me that uh, the news when I got to work one morning that he died the previous night and told me that I was taking over that case right away and directed that I uh, pick up the entire file, which was Huge. 69 dog houses, as I recall. If you can, uh, uh, that's, an, that's an internal term, but, Wait, but it means the binders in which the record is held, which are each about six inches wide? Something like that. It, it, actually, I think the uh, technical term is Princeton Files. Oh, Princeton <laughs> Files, okay. <laughs> we called them dog houses. <laughs> and, uh, uh, those 69 files were uh, all moved on carts down to my area, and uh, my then staff attorney, now Judge Franz Miller, uh, and I went to work on that case. And we were embarrassed because due to Henry's long, long illness, nothing had occurred on the case for well over a year. And uh, Bill, you were named to take Henry's place, and we had to re-argue it. Now, actually, I, I was I was named to take Henry's place, but that was later I, during the period you're talking about. I was sitting on assignment. Uh, so you just the, took his place on the panel, right? Yeah, for that case. Yes. And um, so we had another argument, and then uh, my goal, uh, certainly shared by Sills, was to get that out as soon as possible because it was so important, and we were so embarrassed as a court. Not no one's fault, really, but that we hadn't gotten it uh, out sooner. And uh, uh, I remember that as we got into it, we realized there was kind of a hole in the decision. Uh, uh, despite Judge Dominichini's fine work, there was one major issue that hadn't quite been completely resolved, but it was a court trial. And there's a section in the code that permits the Court of Appeal to fill in uh, factual findings from the record that uh, have 
where there's a gap like this. And so we pondered that, and citing that code section, we filled in these key factual uh, items and, uh, and decided the case. And as soon as that went out, I waited for the bricks to fly because it had been so hotly litigated. And there was a very mild reaction from counsel, and I've since learned from all counsel in the case that they all thought that we had it about right. So I felt good about that <laughs> because it was such a complex yeah. case, as, as you know yeah. very well. Um, so I was proud of that, although the ultimate result was that uh, Gene Autry and the baseball team won. And now I'm a season ticket holder, so people can... <laughs> that was many years ago. I've only been a season ticket holder for a couple. Uh, I trust they, but didn't, anyway, they didn't I, give you a discount No, <laughs> they didn't. They didn't even give me a good seat. Uh, but uh, uh, So I went ahead and, and uh, decided that, and, and uh, people would jokingly say that I drove the Rams to St. Louis <laughs> because they didn't get to do their development. Um, well, Autry and the Angels got to keep their parking. And uh, a year or two later, I think, the Rams uh, left town. Um, and um, another case I remember uh, was a very uh, controversial local case. Um, Orange County filed bankruptcy in about 1994, I think. And uh, two members of the Board of Supervisors, um, Roger Stanton and uh, William Steiner, uh, were charged by the district attorney under a sort of civil or quasi-criminal section with a, a, a sort of a, a dereliction of office or gross negligence as, negligence as supervisors or something. And this was troubling to me because I think the voters have a perfect right to mo remove politicians. Uh, they're automatically removed if they, they're convicted of a felony. They're um, uh, removed if they lose the next election, and they can be removed by being recalled. But this proceeding was the district attorney, whose budget they passed on, deciding that they did a poor job in, in stewardship of the county while uh, the, the issues that led to the bankruptcy were They're growing. basically second-guessing their decisions. Yeah, their political decisions. And that tr was very troubling to me. I didn't know either supervisor, but I as a matter of political science. It was very troubling to me. And we studied that and ultimately came out with a decision which I know Presiding Justice Sills has told me he thought is the finest decision and the most important decision I ever made. And um, it was the subject of huge write-ups for days in the Register and the Times and a lot of commentary uh, all over the country because it, it sort of gave public officials the ability to, to be courageous uh, without having their offices threatened by their district attorney, especially in California that had this procedure. And, um, and so I was proud of that. Um, I do remember a case involving a man named David Perez in my very first year, one of my first cases. Uh, Mr. Perez um, was convicted of gang rape. And I, one of the few times I actually read the whole record rather than the portions that the attorneys called attention to in their briefs. And uh, I didn't feel good about the case. Uh, the identification looked very shaky. It was during the night, in the dark, on the beach in Huntington Beach. Um, a bunch of uh, fellows uh, knocked out. A, a, a young man and his uh, girlfriend were uh, at the beach enjoying this, the uh, evening in August about two in the morning, and uh, a group of uh, men uh, uh, beat the uh, young man unconscious and horribly raped the young woman. And um, there were some serious errors in the case, so it was reversed. And I later learned that uh, uh, the district attorney became doubtful about the conviction and put a, a, a wire, a, a microphone, uh, on the um, uh, on Mr. Perez and put him out on bail and he thought he knew who had done it and it turned out he had just been asleep on the beach a half a mile away and since he was uh, Hispanic and about the age of the fellows who did it he was the only person they found and um, and so the the victim unfortunately was positive he was one of them we didn't have DNA in those days, 
But uh, so they sent him out, and, and he managed to arrange some sort of encounter with the people that he thought might have done it, whom he knew slightly. And when they saw him, they proceeded to regale him with the stories of the whole thing and apologized for his years in jail. But what could we do, David? If we had come forward, we would have gone to prison. <laughs> and uh, so several of them went to prison, deservedly so, and, and he was released. Well, as a, as a judge and as a lover of our legal system, um, I feel gratified that I had a small part in uh, freeing an innocent man. Um, the, probably the worst thing that can happen in our legal system is an innocent man <coughs> going to jail. Would you say that you have or did develop a, a overriding principle of jurisprudence? What, what are the guiding, what gu oh, guided gosh. you in making legal decisions? I, I think I always believed in making the most limited decision you needed to make. Uh, my opinions as uh, Art Gilbert, a great, great justice that we both know and brilliant uh, legal scholar and writer. He introduced me once when he and I were, sh were teaching uh, the rookie class for new appellate justices as the master of the short opinion <laughs> because I tended to edit my opinions. So if you collect all of my opinions, even though there are many, they won't form the huge bulk of gibberish that I think is in so many opinions because they're not edited. I always felt that if you say a lot in an opinion when really you don't need to say as much, you wind up saying things that you regret down the road when you have another case that presents those issues. And so I, I believe that opinions should be short. Um, I don't think I had an agenda, and I'd cite for that uh, Bob Gardner, who uh, I sat next to at a, a dinner or luncheon or something some years after I'd been on the Court of Appeal, and he said, uh, uh, Bob Gardner, the former presiding justice of Division II, and a, and a famous highly opinion regarded, writer. famous opinion <laughs> writer. Santa Clara Law Review has a wonderful mm -hmm. article about his opinions. But uh, uh, Bob said, you know, he said, the lawyers tell me they've, they've figured out Trotter, Trotter, and they've figured out Crosby, and they've figured out Sun and Shine, but they can't figure you out, so you must be doing a great job. <laughs> <laughs> well, a compliment from Bob, uh, yeah. now deceased. And I think uh, the reason is that I'm probably, uh, I think of myself as, as uh, very much uh, a liberal or a libertarian on personal and individual rights and some, somewhat of a uh, pro-business on economic issues. Um, but do you think those kind of, those attitudes that you attribute to yourself, does that, to what extent does that affect, affect your decision making? Or did that affect your decision making? You know, I can't say that it would come into my mind that, gee, I'd like a case to come out a certain way. I didn't really approach them that way. But I always believe that everything in our background has some effect on what we do uh, as judges. Um, we try not to make that the case, but the law is is not a lifeless, uh, dead uh, instrument. It's a very living, breathing thing. And so I think everything that's in our background has some effect. As for myself, I can't really say what that is. I'd have to leave that to others. And I think it would be hard to tell in my case, precisely because I didn't leave a trail of long, long opinions where I was pontificating about all kinds of issues that didn't need to be, be discussed. I think I always believed that procedure was very important, um, that the procedure had to be fair and followed so everyone got an, a fair opportunity to be heard. I clearly had a strong belief in uh, deciding cases on the merits as opposed to on uh, the pleadings. And the reason why I believe in that is if, if a litigant has a dispute and he or she is told that they've lost their case and they never felt they got a chance to be heard, I think a little bit of the respect for the rule of law, which is so important to our society, is lost. And, uh, and so I would rather that people have a chance to be heard and then lose, because at least they then feel they got a chance to be heard. So I wasn't that easy to, to convince and in my day, in the law in motion especially, and even at the Court of Appeal, 
summary judgment was not as frequently granted as it is now. Uh, it was easier to have a triable issue than I think it is today. Uh, and, and I was okay with that. I still am. And I'm old-fashioned. I believe in trials. I believe not in paper warrioring, if that's a word. We have so many paper warriors now who have never tried cases and were terrified if they had to put 12 people in the box and actually present the case. Uh, and I think that's, that's a real loss. And over time, probably long after you and I are gone, Bill, could lead to uh, some disrespect for our legal system that I wouldn't want to happen. Mm -hmm. In Abe Lincoln's time um, in southern Illinois, he was a circuit-riding lawyer, and he had, uh, in one book I read, a couple thousand trials uh, because they were all short, and uh, he would arrive in town with uh, two or three or four other lawyers and the judge, horse and buggy. The word would go out that Abe and the lawyer, the judge and the lawyers are in town, including Abe, and uh, anybody that had a dispute would come rushing into town and pick one of the lawyers, and the lawsuit would be written out, served that day, and a day or two later they'd have the trial, and they'd be there for a week or maybe a, even a month or six weeks, depending on how big the county was, and then they'd move on. Well, in those days then, everybody got their case heard. They tried them all. And uh, win or lose, at least you got a chance to be heard. Here at uh, JAMS, where I am now, what I've discovered is, uh, especially in mediation, if people feel like I, as a now former judicial officer, uh, are listening to what they're presenting and hearing their concerns and expressing to them why I think they should settle and so forth, I think they, they have more respect for the process than if they, they got a call from their lawyer saying, we lost I just case. lost the case. <laughs> <laughs> And so uh, I guess that my philosophy is leans toward hearing on the merits, and uh, and I love trials. So I'm I'm thrilled to hear that cases are going to trial. You know, as I did a little research before uh, today, I was struck by the fact that you have relatively few dissents. Uh, That's true. And uh, is that because uh, there was always immediate agreement among you and your colleagues, or did you work at reaching a consensus? Because compared to some of your colleagues, you have far fewer uh, dissents. That's very true. I, I know that's a fact. And I think the reason is that uh, the people I worked with, Jack and Tom and myself, um, and, and you, and uh, Harmon Scoville, and Dave Sills, uh, at least all of those, and, and Bill uh, Bedsworth, too. We all got along, and I was always anxious to hear what you thought about something, because you might be right. You know, I mean, it's horrible, Not horrible likely. thing. I might be wrong, <laughs> but, uh, but I always felt that I wanted to hear what my colleagues had to say, and, and sometimes I, I would think, well, you know, they've studied this in great detail. I have respect for them, and I didn't see the point in dissenting just to start trouble. And so if I dissented, it was because I really felt strongly and thought that, that it was worthwhile to do so. Um, I would spend a lot more time working on the opinion, regardless of what jurist uh, was presenting it, to make the opinion read well. Because one of the things I did believe in very, very strongly from the outset, and Tom Crosby, uh, shared this too and, and uh, we pushed this frankly against some initial opposition. It's the practice in many courts for you to either sign or not sign an opinion of a colleague regardless of whether you think it's well written or right in all its particulars or not. And I didn't believe in that. I believe that the, even though there is an author that the opinion itself is a collegial opinion from a court of three. And so um, Tom and I believe that there should be a certain level of writing quality about every opinion that left the court. And so uh, we would rigorously edit everything, <laughs> everything. And sometimes people would have too much work or maybe they didn't have a, a skillful a staff assistance on some case. and so. In, in um, particularly with Justice Moore, 
that led to a lot of uh, red pen work. They used to make bets on how many red comments I would make on their drafts. But Henry Moore uh, staff told me several times that he, initially for months he just hated that. He well, wanted me I, to just sign anything he put out. I tell you, Ed, I, as a victim of many of uh -huh. your red pencil marks, I was always expecting a D minus in the <laughs> upper right-hand <laughs> no. corner of the... But, but you know what? <laughs> uh, what uh, they, his, his several, of his, uh, several times his attorneys told me that, you know, he finally said, you know, he, says, he drives me nuts. But the opinion does read better, <laughs> which is all I was trying yeah. to achieve. And he got the credit because his name was on it. And, uh, but I always believed that there's a, coming from a large firm and, and seeing so many wonderfully qu uh, well-qualified law firms bringing cases, I always thought that any opinion, any opinion from the court should be at least as well-written as um, any brief that the court gets, and I don't care which firm it comes from or how outstanding the lawyer is. Um, I, the court had one product. It's a business that produces only one product, its opinions. Nothing else mattered. And so one of the things that I did is I, I involved myself in every case and used my... Uh, and, uh, whatever abilities I might have as an editor, and it's always a lot easier to edit than it is to create the initial product, and I realize that, and it's also painful to get the comments, and I realized that too. But, um, but I only did it because I wanted a good product, and in the end, with a good product, I didn't need to agree with every line. If I thought the result was correct, I had enough respect for my colleagues to believe that well, they thought this was right, and why shouldn't I go along? So I had to find a really good reason for thinking that I ought to dissent. Um, I also think that the, the role of dissent is not as significant at the intermediate appellate court. I think in the Supreme Court, it's different, because you might be talking to the legislature or the Congress of your, the U.S. Supreme Court, and uh, uh, maybe they will see what you've, you've done and want to make a change. But I don't think anyone at that level is paying attention to what we do at the Court of Appeal, even though the lawyers are. And uh, so I just didn't dissent just for the sake of uh, twisting the tail of my colleagues. Uh, and so you're right, there aren't very many. D, uh, let's change the subject a minute before we wind up. I'd like to have you talk a little bit about your family. I know you have four children. I, How? I have four children. Uh, any a grandson? daughter who is now 39, a son who's 37, and two boys who are 18 and 16. And their, their names are uh, Amy, uh, Matt, uh, Andy, and Alex. Any the, grandchildren yet? I have four grandsons, no granddaughters. Um, my grandsons range in age from 3 to 12. And uh, my Two youngest sons still live with me and, and go to high school here in, at El Modena High School. Uh, one will be graduating. And uh, my uh, uh, older children, um, one lives in Redlands, my daughter, and she and her husband have a wonderful business that's very, very successful, a manufacturing business out in Banning, actually. And um, my um, uh, son, who's 37 and has a three-year-old son, lives in... Um, outside of Charlottesville, Virginia, but he's been in the movie industry yeah. for, worked for George Lucas for years and has been a visual effects producer and now is an assistant professor of... Um, at the University of Virginia? In, no, at uh, Virginia Commonwealth mm -hmm. University, actually. He lives closer to the University mm -hmm. of Virginia. And uh, he still does his movie projects on the side, but he's enjoying teaching these very high-end skills that he has. He's worked on many movies. Uh, he spent months in New Zealand on King Kong, and he's worked on all the Star Wars remakes. Uh, he uh, has uh, worked on Twister and uh, Jurassic Park, and uh, most recently Man of the Year, which was a Robin Williams movie. Uh, and dozens of others, uh, and he has a creative ability that is totally beyond anything his father possesses. <laughs> I have none of that. 
<laughs> uh, well, so far you haven't persuaded any of them to go into the law school, I gather. How about no. your younger ones? Are you still working uh, on that? My them, daughter or? has mentioned a couple of times, but I don't know that she'll ever do it now, that she thought maybe someday she'd go back to school and go to law school. Uh -huh. She would be excellent. Uh, and I don't know what the younger ones are going to do, and I don't think they do either. No. I think they'll do well, but... Uh, I think Even they if, might, they, uh, if they thought they did know, they probably would end up doing something different anyway. <laughs> I'm absolutely positive that the thought of being a lawyer never crossed my mind when I was their age and didn't really, um, the thought of going to law school didn't really cross yeah. my mind until I was at least a junior in college. And you didn't have any family members who were lawyers or... Uh, I, not only that, I didn't even know a lawyer. Mm -hmm. um, when, I, when I made the decision to go to law school in my last year of college, my recollection is that my father took me to lunch with a lawyer he knew uh, who uh, represented uh, a union that he was uh, secretary treasurer of and a number of other unions and who was a very fine and well-respected lawyer. But unfortunately, that lawyer, uh, uh, it later came out when I was a federal prosecutor, my dad sent me the clippings, had probably never filed a tax return. And the IRS <laughs> caught up with him. And he um, he sold out all his apartment buildings because by. Let's uh, ask again that when you were deciding. Uh, yeah, you were, you oh, met so my, with my a father lawyer. took me to lunch with this uh, lawyer in Minneapolis that he knew, who was a very nice fellow, and uh, that lawyer um, was later indicted and um, fled the nation because. Uh, Canada didn't extradite for income tax offenses. And he so he moved to Thunder Bay, Ontario and retired and he was ne he never returned. I'm <laughs> sure he's dead by now. <laughs> and uh, um, but that was the only lawyer I'd even yeah. met when I started law school. Okay, the uh, let's wind this up, but <laughs> just is what do you have any words of wisdom to offer to other judges, be they trial court judges or appellate judges or or to lawyers. Uh, well, Leonard Goldstein told me right when I became a judge, Leonard was a longtime Superior Court judge here, uh, that to remember from the first day you become a judge, you are in fact equal to every other member of the court. And you should be perfectly willing to enter into the discussion and debate and make the decisions. It's not as if you're a junior member and you look to your colleagues for guidance on how to decide cases. You may get some help from them on how to organize a staff and how to, how to manage your cases, but uh, I thought that was good advice, that every judge is the same, the pay is the same, um, and um, as far as lawyers, um, I think, I think a, a lot of it is Successful lawyers seem to me to be people with a lot of uh, personal confidence, and I don't mean arrogance, I mean confidence. Who, and confidence means that you can recognize the merit in the other side's position or in the other side's arguments and can find a way to compromise and achieve a, a good and a fair result for your client. And that the people who don't do as well in our business are often people who just adamantly refuse to recognize um, the abilities uh, or the, the arguments that others have. Um, I never wanted to be that sort of person. Uh, I might mention, too, that something I was really proud of that I just never thought of mentioning. Both Jennifer Keller, who worked for me as a staff lawyer for a number of years, and Franz Miller, who worked for me for more than a decade, uh, became presidents of the Bar Association in consecutive years of the Orange County Bar. I was very proud of that. And my proudest personal achievement is unquestionably getting the Franklin G. West Award from the Orange County Bar, uh, the Lifetime Achievement Award. Every time I think about that, I still keep it uh, in a prominent place at home. It just humbles me so much to be recognized by in this outstanding place, one of the premier places for lawyers, I think, in America because of our tremendous economy here in Orange County. So I, I've, I've always been proud of that and proud to be here. I've missed being in Minnesota where most of my relatives were. I've visited often, but it's too cold there for me. You've anyway. not regretted your move no. to Southern California. No. Uh, 
I'm now uh, married uh, for the third and I trust and hope the final time. Um, and uh, uh, I've been here at JAMS as a, a panelist and soon after I started a bunch of us bought the company. So there's now about 70 some uh, people were organized kind of like a law firm. Uh, and I enjoy this. I enjoyed settlement conferences as a judge. I know you did, and you were very good at it. In fact, and you were the best settlement conference judge on our court. Oh, thank at, you. Uh, I trained Bob Wolf, who now <laughs> does that at the court, and I understand yeah. does very well. Um, I remember when uh, uh, we decided to have that uh, program where we would have uh, a senior lawyer like Bob involved. And so I was supposed to train Bob. So I said, well, Bob, I can't teach you how to do what I do. You can watch a little bit. But the first day we were to operate uh, separately, I said, here's what I want you to do. If you settle your case, great. If you don't, before you let him go home, I want you to come and see me, and we'll decide whether there's anything to do. So on the very first day, he came to see me. He said, there's no hope. The parties were not moving, making no progress. Tell me what the case was about, and I think my reaction was, oh, for heaven's sake, because it seemed like something that ought to settle. And, and um, so I said, well, keep them for a few minutes. And I sent the folks I had to lunch. And I went down there, and um, in about 15 minutes, I got the two sides to cross in their offers <laughs> and settle the case. And Bob and uh, Tom Crosby had a student extern who was also watching and mm -hmm. working with Bob, and who happened to be from the University of Minnesota, I remember that. They were just stunned. <laughs> and for weeks, anybody that would listen, Bob would tell that story. <laughs> and, uh, and you know Bob, he's a delightful yeah. guy. Well, I, I'm sure as a result of your skills in that area that you are in uh, rather high demand here at I, I do keep very busy here yeah. and uh, every kind of uh, case imaginable. Do you do um, mostly mediations or mostly arbitrations? Uh, or? Mostly mediations, but arbitrations tend to take longer. So uh, even if you do 80% mediations, you probably it's probably 60% of your time. Uh, arbitrations can take weeks and almost always take at least yeah. several days. Okay, um, anything else that uh, you think would be uh, um, good for the world to know that I have not asked you about? I don't think so. Why don't we stop for a minute and just talk about okay. that and see if we can think of anything. Else. Okay, uh, we're coming to the end of this uh, proceeding here and just like to hear if you have any thoughts about the future of the courts, the future of our legal system, uh, what, where are we heading? Um, well, I think I feel positive about it in, in most respects. Uh, I think that the courts have learned a great deal on how to be more efficient. And Bill, the best example I can think of is the switch from master calendar to individual calendaring in our trial courts, which I personally thought was a mistake when it occurred, but of course I was wrong. Um, it was uh, a, a something that has actually resulted in many more cases being moved through the system with a relatively similar uh, number of personnel. I think I'm a little concerned that what I do now at JAMS in mediating and arbitrating so many major cases may have uh, moved so many legally significant cases that uh, will not now be in the system and therefore will not contribute to the development of the law in the way that perhaps they should. And so if I were creating a perfect legal system, we would just be spending more money on it, spending more money on our judges, uh, and having more courts so that people who have major disputes would not feel that they needed to come to an organization like the one I'm part of, uh, and they would instead keep their their uh, disputes in the courts where they ought to be. Uh, I'm also a bit concerned about the, um, the small number of lawyers who are still getting significant trial experience. Smaller. <laughs> Smaller all the yeah, time. Yeah. I saw a number uh, of how few federal trials, federal civil jury trials there were uh, nationwide in a 
recent year where someone had counted them up, and the number was shockingly low um, because federal judges are becoming more case managers than trial judges as well. And I do think that uh, a lot is lost. I, I fear that in the next generation, there won't be any trial lawyers. Uh, the only exception is probably going to be the training you can get in the criminal law, which I know you did some criminal cases as a young lawyer as well. Not very many. <laughs> yeah, but but that gave you some that gave you a chance to experience yeah. Charlie Carr. That's right. We get to do one of these on you. I you, know that story. You remember my experience <laughs> yeah, with Charlie Carr. I certainly Carr. do. <laughs> uh, and um, but so my concerns are more that we need to do something to create more opportunities for people to become better at trials. And you know, eventually we're going to have a bench uh, where the bench officers won't have had much trial experience. That isn't healthy. That, that part concerns me. But in terms of their quality, their quality of their education, um, I think today's uh, lawyers and uh, judges are better than ever. Um, and uh, I would wish as a society we committed more to uh, our legal system. I'm, st I'm a little bit unhappy with the kind of extreme partisanship that too often uh, gets involved in especially our federal appointment process. And as a former federal prosecutor, I'm frankly almost horrified by the current controversy that's in the news lately over the Attorney General and the replacement of U.S. attorneys, which is alleged to have been for political purposes. When I was in the U.S. Attorney's Office, I served half the time under a Democrat and a Democratic president, half the time under a Republican. And um, under both, the office was not political at all. In fact, I once had a case pending that I was in, uh, handling a grand jury investigation that involved a company where uh, the late Republican Senator George Murphy was, uh, had been a vice president. And he was being excoriated in the media in that particular campaign because ever since he had left them and while he was in the Senate, he had kept his company credit card and they were honoring it for a sizable amount of money every year. Today that would probably be illegal. In those days it was just uh, bad politics. And I don't think he did anything bad necessarily, but it just looked bad. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, uh, But I was, we were investigating that same company for a totally unrelated mail fraud argument, which ultimately we didn't prosecute. But I remember going to Matt Byrne and saying, you know, it would be unfair to the senator if anything about this leaked out or if we kept nosing around with this right now because this totally doesn't involve him or even his tenure at the company. And Matt agreed. So we laid the investigation aside for six weeks or so and then ultimately finished it up and concluded it shouldn't be prosecuted. Mm -hmm. Today they would probably want to leak it out. Yeah. And that, that offends me. I remember that uh, uh, Matt Byrne was retained for a number of months as the U.S. Attorney by the Nixon administration, even though it's always been the practice of presidents to replace every U.S. attorney when a new president takes office, and I think that's perfectly fine. But um, uh, Matt was kept on because the first candidate that the Republicans were planning to appoint, the FBI investigation uncovered that everyone agreed he was just a terrible lawyer, just terrible, and so they, they didn't want to name a terrible lawyer, so they didn't name him. The second one, um, that they were thinking of appointing, it turned out was a very active member of swingers clubs in the San Fernando <laughs> Valley, and they didn't want to appoint him either. And uh, so when they finally got around to appointing someone, he was a tax lawyer with no criminal or civil trial experience of any kind. But he was a very straight and honest guy. Uh, we formed a good relationship. I was uh, the only non-chief or assistant chief of an office section that was always invited to the management group meetings, which would be held at a big table like a jury table in his office. I'd sit down at the end as quietly as I could and was very honored to be there as a 26 or 7-year-old kid at that point. 
And um, uh, I know that when Byrne was still the U.S. attorney, there was a, uh, he had hired a, a, a one of the fellows to, uh, hired a young lawyer to become an assistant U.S. attorney, and he got a call from the Department of Justice saying, well, we can't process his paperwork and start his security clearance because you didn't tell us what party he is. Byrne never asked, mm -hmm. so he didn't know. He honestly <laughs> didn't know. So he called the guy up who was offended to be asked, but he said, well, I'm a Republican. So Byrne could call back and say he's a Republican. But I have to tell you that that only happened once. That, that was very early in the uh, Nixon administration, and that soon um, they realized that wasn't something they would ask. And so it never happened again. And I'm positive that both Republicans and Democrats were hired by Republicans or Democrats. And that's, that's the way we were, and we did everything we could to be uh, non-political. And, uh, and so I was, I've always been very proud of my service as a federal prosecutor, in part because of that. And so I was uh, almost sick to read about uh, some of this, if it turns out to be true. I'm willing to let the facts be developed. But um, I'm, I'm a little concerned about that. I don't think it's right to um, base decisions on politics, regardless of what party people are, what their political beliefs are. Some people do bad things, and uh, they should uh, be removed from office or go to jail for them. And uh, I can, right now, I can think of people in both parties who either have gone to jail or maybe ought to uh, for things that I've heard about. Um, I'm also proud of the fact that in our legal system here in California, it's totally honest. If, if somebody asked me during all my years as a judge how, to fix a parking ticket, <laughs> I wouldn't know how I could go about doing that, nor would I. But When people ask me to, to do that, I always say, I only fix felonies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I remember at the Court of Appeal, a, a, a fellow who was doing some painting uh, just chatting with me one day, and he said, say, he wondered if I could help him out. And he had a ticket. I forget if it was a parking ticket or a speeding ticket or something. He showed it to me. And I looked to see what the fine was. And I said, yeah, I can fix that for you. You gave uh, him the money? Give me the money. He <laughs> said, well, that's, that's what it says already. And I said, I know, but um, I said, you're busy, but I could use the walk at lunch someday this week, I can walk from the Court of Appeal on Spurgeon over to the Municipal Court in those days and, and pay the ticket for you, and you won't have to take time off from work. I said, but that's the best I can do. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, Bill, you and I have certainly read about things that happen in places like Chicago or Texas or Alabama that never happen here. And uh, I hope that the succeeding generation of uh, lawyers and judges, uh, generations, can maintain that about our state. That is, that is very important to me, and certainly to you, I know. Um, and I, I'm saying since you're here, I've always enjoyed you as a colleague, and I'm very honored that you oh, took the you. time today to, to do thank this you. with me. Thank you. Well, that's mutual. Okay, thank you, Ed. I think okay. uh, we've come to the end of the proceedings. I'm hungry. Yeah, let's go eat. <laughs> uh